Well, you'll have to put up with a B-26 pilot today. <laughs> I was born in Minneapolis, but grew up up in Fargo, North Dakota. And shortly before the war, I was working as a ticket agent up there for Northwest Airlines. They sent a traveling team up through the Dakotas looking for cadets. I signed up, and they uh, signed me up in February of 42 put us on leave because they didn't have room for us at any of the training bases. I didn't get into the Army until August of 42. Went down into the Southeast Training Command, went through all the rigmarole down there, ended up in uh, Turner Field in Albany, Georgia, got my wings there, and <clears throat> I was going to be kept as a, try and be an instructor down there, so I was in ground school for a week learning about things, and they, uh, they came through one day and said, see, we got a married guy here that wants to do this. You go on and fight the war. So by then I didn't have any choice as to what I could get into. And they said, well, you can go to B-17s in Tucson. I said, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Maybe I can trade with somebody. Well, I found a fellow that lived in Tucson, and he, he was assigned to the B-26s. So I traded with him and ended up going to Tampa, Florida. Well, this was in June of 43. Well, a year before that is when the famous saying of a plane a day in Tampa Bay happened. Now, they didn't all go in the water, but they did lose 28 airplanes that month. And of course, Congress got into it, and they were really, Truman tried to shut the airplane down. But they'd been having good luck with it over in the South Pacific and up in Alaska, it had been flying up there. So they kept us around. They did cut our outfit in half. They sent half of them to B-24s. Well, here again, I was lucky, stayed in the B-26. So we went around the uh, states at three or four different airports during 1943. And about in October, they decided to reactivate the group and send us overseas. Well, I was made, I got my own crew, made first pilot at that time, <clears throat> got my own crew, and we left for the, well, I will re go back a little bit, in October of 43, <coughs> excuse me, I had a brother killed in B-24s. He was out in Tonopah, Nevada, and they were on a night takeoff, and the air engine, or the airplane stalled, killed them all. But <coughs> we went overseas in January, or left in February of 44. We couldn't go across the North Atlantic because of our short range and the bad weather up there. So we made the 10,000 mile trek down through South America, the Ascension Islands, and up the west coast of Africa. We made five stops going down in, on the uh, South America <clears throat> and three stops over in Africa before we ended up in England on Washington's birthday, February 22nd of 44. Well, we had to practice for a little bit and uh, get ready. They were using us in at the uh, medium altitude from 9 to 12,000 feet. A year before, I think it was in uh, May of 43, that they ran the first B-26 out of England. They were actually in the 8th Air Force in 1943. When I got there in 1944, we were the 9th Air Force. They ran a trip over, they were trying to use it at a low level, which they had done down in uh, the South Pacific and also down in North Africa. Well, they sent one, the first mission went out and they had pretty good luck. They didn't hit the target, but they got back. <laughs> they were at two or three hundred feet and they couldn't find their target. Well, Three days later, they sent out 11 of them at 300 feet, crossed the channel to hit some Ebo pins in Amoyden, Holland. One airplane aborted over the channel. He lost the engine, came back. The other 10 were either shot down by flak or the German fighters got them. So the 10 of them went down. Well, about this time, they decided they better change the, what they're going to use it for. That's why we're back in training in the States and they didn't know what to do with us. They just kind of moved us around from place to place until they 
started using them at the higher altitudes. Well, we ended up uh, northeast of London at a field there, and were there on D-Day, which was quite a mission in itself. And I'm sure some of you people were on that fiasco. But we took off in a 500-foot ceiling. It was raining, and we flew all of ours in six ship elements, real close formation. That's the way we did our bombing. And so we formed up under the clouds. And I was on the right wing of the leader. And all, uh, most of the time, all I could see was a little green light. And I kept it as close as I could to the cockpit without running into it. And we climbed up through the clouds. Lost two airplanes in the climb because we were headed out to the east. And the lead airplane, we were having trouble getting on top. So he decided to make a turn so we wouldn't get over Holland. So he made a turn, and in that turn, the guys below us, two of them crashed into each other. They lost track and, and uh, lost two airplanes there. The rest of us climbed up, and we rejoined with some other flights up on top at 11,000 feet. It's daylight. We went down and found a hole in the channel, over the channel, spiraled on down to 1,500 feet. And that's the altitude we went in and bombed Utah Beach. And the channel, of course, was just full of, of boats. I mean, there are ships. They're just, you could, everywhere you looked, there were boats. And we, as we ran in our bombing run, the, uh, about a quarter mile offshore is the landing barges. And I thought to myself, you guys are going to be digging a hole in the sand tonight. And if I get through the flak, I'm going to be back in a nice warm bunk. And that's unfortunately happened. Our outfit ran two, uh, flights on two missions on D-Day, but I was only in on the first one. <clears throat> the, uh, we then moved down to the south coast of England after D-Day and bombed in front of our own troops. I'd had 33 missions in by D-Day, and supposedly you were going to go home after 50. Well, when D-Day came along, as, they, as you guys know, they told us all, just hang around until we don't need you anymore. Well, we went to the south coast of England kept bombing in front of our own troops. We had quite a fiasco one day down at St. Lo, when they had a big sailmate there at St. Lo. We went in and dropped our bombs, but we had an accidental release. What we would do is fly in our six ships. When the lead bomber there opened his bomb base, my guy would toggle his open. When he saw the first bomb drop out, he would hit the switch to drop ours. Well, on the way going in that day, the lead airplane opened up his bomb bay doors. One bomb accidentally released. Our guys toggled them out. We killed 151 Americans. So bomb, because we were bombing right ahead of them. We were just going over the top of them. We were still over friendly territory when we dropped their bombs. Well, the next day, we went back in there again, and they shot down three of our airplanes. So, you know, then the generals got together and said, let's kind of cut this out. That's, uh, we're all fighting the same war. But we moved over to France in August of 44, and I flew about three or four more missions, had my 66 in them, and they let us come home. They, set, they went from 50 missions to 65, and some of us, they just said, well, whenever you're, we can let you go, we will. And I ended up taking an airplane one day and <clears throat> going over. We were flying supplies down to another airport that we were going to move to. And I took a camera along, had my uh, waist gunner with a camera, and I have a whole bunch of pictures of bridges that we bombed out. They've been rebuilt by the Americans with pontoon bridges, but we went down up and down the rivers there and took pictures of some of the bridges, and it was just quite a sight. And you can see the pattern bombing that we did because you just see the potholes of the bottles of the uh, bombs in there. Well, I came back from over there in October. We got back to the States in October. Had a little R&R &R at home. Then reported to Harlingen, Texas, where they had a B-24 gunnery school. Yep, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they, uh, we were assigned to strip down B-26s to tow targets for them. And I always told the tow target operator in my airplane, if those bullets start coming up that sleeve too far, cut it. He did it twice for him. We were, <laughs> those gunners were getting a little too close to our airplane. But we did that, and it was at that time 
down in Harlingen that I ran, <coughs> excuse me, we first encountered the WASPs, the Women Air Force. They were flying B-26s down there, towing targets. There were seven of them, still assigned, and I got to fly with them. Every so often we just trade off flying captain and co-pilot. And they were deactivated, of course, in December of 44, but we got in a few, few flights together down there. And I do still see some of them around at the different uh, places in the states, go to the different air shows. In fact, there were a bunch of them out here at uh, Flying Cloud last summer when we, when Luke and I had a booth out there on the 26. They were right next to us. And it's one that I've seen around the seats. There's still a bunch of them around, still flying. Two of them down in Tucson are still flying the airplanes every day now and they're out of the airport in Tucson. Um, <coughs> the, uh, by about June of 45, I was uh, had enough points to get out. So I got out of the service and went over to Northwest and applied for a pilot job. Well, they said it'll be a couple months. They're looking at for higher ease. So in August of 45, I got a job with Northwest as a pilot. And I flew with them for 36 years. Flew 12 different, <coughs> 12 different airplanes. Uh, fortunately, Northwest was a big enough carrier, and they had over there were starting to get their overseer runs at, over to Tokyo and things. And they, I had seven, flew seven different prop airplanes and five different jets. Ended up the last seven years on the 747. And the young man the other day was talking about the power on the B-52. His engines had 20, he had eight engines with 25,000 pounds of thrust on uh, each engine. Well, the last 747 I flew had four engines with each, each one of them had 50,000 pounds of thrust. And now they have one that's coming out. There's a jet engine coming out on a twin engine big jet that'll have 100,000 pounds of thrust in each engine. So, but the, oh, let's see, there's something I wanted to mention about the, oh, one of the airplanes that I flew for Northwest was a Martin 202. Now this was the offshoot of the 26. And it was a lousy airplane. <laughs> yeah, we had 25 of them. Lost five of them to accidents. And at that time, we had pilots on our line that were aeronautical engineers, and they could see the design problems with the airplane. So we had to uh, tell the company that we, if we gave them a certain date. If they didn't send them back to the factory, we were going to ground them. So in March of 52, we grounded the other 20 airplanes. Of course, a lot of us on the bottom of the list went way down. We, in fact, I think I just hung on by one number at that time. But uh, it wasn't a very good airplane. They sold them to South America, but they put them through the factory first, which is what we wanted the airline to do. So that's about it. The, uh, well, I think that the B-26, the Baltimore Horror, and the Flying Prostitute and all, we had great luck with that airplane. Once we get out of the training environment, it was great. We get our own crew, get our own mechanics. Luke was one of them out down in North Africa, a mechanic on them. And once we got together that way, we didn't have any problem. We had probably one of the lowest loss ratios. It was one half of 1% in combat. It was really a good deal. Our missions were very short. We had, uh, I think I only had 200 and 40 or 50 hours of combat flying in 66 missions. So you can see we didn't go very far. It was only about two and a half, three hour average flight. So we always had good fighter protection. We could always pick up the, yeah. the uh, hurricanes and spitfires could meet us out over the channel and go all the way to the target and back with us. So we didn't have to have, we didn't have the problem with German fighters. And speaking of those, I don't know if any of you saw this film on uh, the History Channel on Sunday, they talked about the German's uh, ME-262 jet. It was quite a thing. If you get a chance to, I'm going to make a copy or two and bring them out here so people would like to take them home and look at them, because it was really interesting to see if Hitler would have won the war if he had done it right. He tried to make bombers out of them instead of keeping his fighters. And they show him knocking down 24s and 17s. just 
They were so fast. 51s finally caught up with them. And they could get them, if they get them on a dive, the P-51s could get at them, and if they made a turn, they could turn inside of them and get them. Also, they'd go to the airport where they were taking off and landing from, catch them on takeoff and landing. There were people in there, pilots in those jets, that only had 10, 12 hours of flying time. And, you know, so this, this is what saved us. Any questions? How many hours of flying time do you have? Oh, well, let's see. 24,000. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had, uh, I had, I had about 15, uh, about 16,000 in props and 8,000 in jets. Okay. Split them up everywhere. Any other questions? Yes? Well, all your emissions made with the short wing, the wind Yes, the uh, 26, the ones that we took overseas, the ones in the South Pacific and the early training ones had the 65-foot wingspan. And we took the C models to them over. They were set, they lengthened up to 71 feet. Gave us much more wing area, slower landing and takeoff speeds, much more maneuverable. And where they had the trouble in the first one, because of the stubby wing, and they just had a lot of trouble with them. Well, <laughs> it goes back to what they found was some of the design failure was inside the airplane where they had one thing that the hydraulic line was going over a heater and it developed a leak and burned one of the airplanes up and he spun in. They had uh, one on a training trip up here with our check pilots in it, training pilots, and one of the props went into reverse. Not supposed to do that, <laughs> but it did. And that was one of them that spun in. They thought it was, you know, started to pull them to the right, and so they had more power. And of course, that just accentuated the reversing, and down they went. They lost one in the thunderstorm down at Lenona. Well, we can't say that's necessarily the airplane's fault. We didn't have radar at that time. We used to have to go through all these same storms without radar that you have today. Yeah, one hit the flagpole, and that was a... A glide slope, they feel it was a glide slope error. They let him get down too low before he could pull out. He hit the flight going hit it with a yes. Was there one that uh, crashed off the end of uh, the, the north runway uh, about Christmas time, 1943? Do you remember that? The B-26? The 26 lost yeah. engine. Yeah, he flipped over. Well, this is one of the problems they had with those earlier models, too, was that if he lost an engine on takeoff, we got so we trained our people that if you lost an engine, pull the other throttle back a little bit because the torque will pull you over. And if you couldn't get up to wind your trim, the trim tab was way up here on the ceiling, oh. and you had to reach up. Yeah, and they, uh, I had two accidents in them, uh, two crash landings. One was, um, I knew the um, nose wheel, and then we always checked the nose wheel here before we went into land. It was flat, and that's, we'd had a lot of flat going through the airplane, but that was the only thing, problem we could see. So I landed, and it was dusk, and there was a silver airplane ahead of me. I was rolling out, and I didn't see him. They fired a red flag. Now well, that means stop. So I hit the brakes, the nose wheel collapsed. So that was all of that one, and everybody got out of the problem. The other one was a, another hydraulic problem. We knew we'd lost our hydraulics uh, coming home from the target. So I just said, well, that's OK. We'll set it down, let it roll out. I'll shut the engines down. Let it roll out. When it gets near the end, I'll reach up and pull the air brake, which we had a handle up here with the air. Well, I did everything right. I'm rolling down there, reach up and pull this, and it comes out in my hand. No, no air brakes. It had been, that cable had been shot off, too. Well, we were at a limey base over there, and when we first went in there, they cut the trees down at the other end of the runway so we could make our heavy takeoffs and be able to get clear the trees. Well. Off the end of the runway we went, and I watched this big stump. For one of the trees go right by here, took the left gear off. I couldn't, I, I didn't have any brakes. I cut the engine, so I couldn't change the, the airplane was just going to go there. <laughs> but that's all. Nobody got hurt. Uh, you know, we were only going 40, 50 miles an hour, and we hit it. But, <laughs> so that was the only, any other question? I
There's a forum up on, uh, they were ferrying them up to Alaska to uh, lend lease them to Russia. And they were flying up the Alcan Highway. They had very few navigational aids going up there at the time. They were down below the clouds, and they were about to run out of fuel. They didn't know they were only 20 miles from Whitehorse because there was some little hills they had there. So they decided while they still had fuel under control, they just put them down in the, in the marsh up there. And was, that's what they did. They had a forum on the ground up there. Yes, sir. There's a story in a book about the building of the Alcan Highway to the Air Force. And there's one chapter in there about the B-26s. And it seemed like the fellow who we got the information from was a co-pilot. He said when they took off from, from, from Seattle area, he said he had, he had 10 hours of flight time in the B-26. And he said he was the co-pilot because the pilot only had five more hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's about right. Yes. Well, this is one of, I think that one might have ended up being Carolyn, which was one we had down, down in Oklahoma for a while. And that crashed on a, uh, they were up checking a crew out. And of course, they had no flight recorders or anything like that, so we don't know what happened to it. But it was on Downwind Lake to go in and land, and it just spun out and killed them all. There's still one B-26 in operation. Kermit Weeks has it down in Florida at his museum down there. And he, he flies it around once in a while. He came up to Oshkosh one, one uh, summer, but uh, he lost, uh, had trouble with an engine on takeoff, so it sat up there for about six months while they uh, decided what to do, and they finally took the engine down and fixed it. There's another story, I don't know how true it is. They said when uh, Bruno came back from his, his uh, Tokyo raid, he was sent down to England to, to evaluate the B-26 because of the airport. Yes. Oh yeah, they did it. Those. This is what I say. It was the training is where we had the problem. Once you got used to the airplane, you didn't have to. We used to have the feather engine. We we practice this, you know, just in our time to to learn how to to use the airplane. But the instructors down in Tampa were a little leery of that airplane, and I don't think they gave us a real good instruction job. They were sort of afraid of it from the record they had, but Doolittle did come down there because Truman wanted to shut this thing down two or three times. And they, just because the record over in the South Pacific would tell it. Yes? How many on the crew of the B-26 and what type of ordinance did you have? Well, <clears throat> we had a uh, full complement was seven. We had the pilot, co-pilot, and the lead airplane had a navigator. I didn't need one because I was always following somebody. Then I had a bombardier. Uh, engineer that managed the top turret, had twin, uh, twin 50s up in the top turret. I had a radio operator that up, did the waste guns out the side on the back, one out, each, 50 caliber out each side. Then I had a tail gunner that had dual 50s back there in the turret. And we had one sticking out the nose. The bombardier could use a 50 out there. I had four 50s alongside, two on each side, that I could fire from the control wheel. Of course, this was designed for strafing and all, which they used it down in the Pacific, you know, in North African times for strafing. So I never had to fire by In fact, we had very little fighter problems because I've talked to some Luftwaffe pilots at some of these reunions they have around different places in the States. And they said, no, we didn't bother the 26 because if we got a tight formation, which we did, and we could lower and raise like this, and we could have so much firepower sticking out one side or the other that they didn't bother us. Plus, we usually had fire protection up above or below us. We were, because of the short range. It wasn't like you guys that made those long trips and without any fire protection. Any other thing? 